I'm going to start with the general. Uh, general, if there's a nuclear attack at Cox Arena, no, if there's a nuclear attack in the United States or elsewhere before the rapture of the church, what should we as Christians be doing to prepare for such an event and what is the likely scenario of the aftermath of a nuclear, nuclear attack? What should we be doing to prepare? First of all, I think that uh, as we look at the potential aftermath of that, uh, I, what I think uh, we're going to see, and, and it doesn't, you didn't say in, a, in the United States. Yeah, in the United States. I'm wondering if, okay, in the United States. Your feelings about that, that the potential of it happening. Well, I think that, as I said this morning, I think that the potential for a dirty bomb to uh, be exploded in this country is increasing every day as the North Koreans and the Iranians uh, develop more and more nuclear capabilities and, and as the, uh, frankly, as Pakistan becomes more and more unstable um, and the likelihood of a, uh, an Islamic uh, extremist government taking over there, the, the likelihood becomes greater uh, day by day. If uh, it was to uh, occur in this country and it was a dirty bomb, depending upon where it uh, actually occurred, I think that the, uh, the outcome could be uh, pretty devastating if it was uh, Washington, which would essentially shut our government down because it's A, it's difficult for people to get out of Washington, B, the very people that are, are, are paid to bring uh, order in chaos, the police, the firefighters, the first responders, would most likely be trying to get to their own families and uh, take care of them. So I think there'd be pandemonium. Now, in a, a broader sense, I think that uh, if it was an actual nuclear weapon, as Joel wrote about in Dead Heat, one of the big things we've got to worry about is electromagnetic pulse, which would essentially cut out all our communications, our vehicles would not work, and lots of other bad things would happen as a result of the EMP. And then I think economically, uh, there would be a period of time where we would literally uh, be uh, living off of whatever we've been able to store uh, or whatever is readily available, but uh, our, our free market economy would uh, probably be uh, devastated for some period of time. So uh, it's a bad scenario. Um, Joel, this is for you. This is, uh, doesn't give a date, but it has to be in the last 36, 36 hours. Bloomberg News published an article following the G20 meetings in London entitled, quote, G20 shapes new world order. The G20 is the 20 leaders of the world that control the finances that just happened in London this week. G20 shapes new world order with lesser role for the United States markets. So to, uh, this just happened this week. To what degree is the global economic crisis accelerating the movement towards one world government in this new world order? What role do you see the U.S. is going to play? Well, that is a good question, and one I, you know, alluded to a little bit in the in my message uh, earlier. The economic crisis is so bad. I, I mentioned that you know, 40 to 45 percent of the world's wealth has been lost, vanished in the last 18 months or so. So things are so bad, uh, the dollar has declined so steeply against the euro and other currencies, people are losing confidence in the United States as the economic engine of the world. Right. They're losing confidence in the dollar as the uh, medium of foreign exchange. And what, what was discussed uh, leading into this conference, the conference, the G20 was only a day, essentially a day, a little bit more than a day, so it wasn't a full-blown, detailed plan, but, but coming into this was talk of a radical reconstructive surgery effort to completely transform the financial architecture of the world. Russia, uh, Russian leaders, Chinese leaders, came into the conference saying, we need to go to a single common global currency, but not the dollar. Uh, now, a few weeks ago, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said we need to go to a single common currency. He was talking about the Muslim world. The, uh, the leader of uh, Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, 
said in January, he was quoted by the BBC as saying that, he, he's just been elected, by the way, uh, Gaddafi as the chairman or the, the chief of all Africa. There's something called the African Union, the sort of model off of the European Union, and, and Gaddafi's just been elected the head of it, and he has persuaded at least 200 African leaders to now call him the King of Kings. This isn't the BBC reporting, you know, there's not Joel Rosenberg whacked out website, right? I mean, this, this, you know, I'm not saying that the BBC necessarily isn't perceived that way by some, but I'm just saying... No, are you it, saying that Joel Rosenberg's whacked out? Well, people think that, you know, okay. I mean, uh, what did Glenn Beck call me, the, cra the president of Crazy Town, USA, so, yes. I, you know, but that being said, uh, Gaddafi wants to go to a single currency for Africa, a single army for Africa, a single passport for Africa. My point is, what happened after the uh, convulsions in Europe, after World War II, World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, and the Cold War was, we've got to unify. We've got to pull everything together, one currency, one political system, one passport. And other parts of the world are beginning to think that way. Now, the book of Revelation says that's where we're headed. People like Pastor Chuck Smith, who've been teaching that and other elements of the end times for many years, have been thought, oh, people say, yeah, come on, nobody is thinking that. Well, this month they are, and that is something to watch uh, closely and, and to be concerned about. Uh, there are actually now 54 countries watching Q&A. Welcome. Welcome um, to the four, 54 countries. Um, is Iran on that list right now? Iran I is, so. uh, no, but Palestinian territory is on the list, Good. and Turkey just came on. Wonderful. And that's w wonderful, yes. That's, and Bahamas. Somebody's <laughs> kicking back probably. It, and, it must be raining there or something, you know. <laughs> um, let, let's uh, throw this one uh, to you, General. Will, it was addressed to Joel, but will it be necessary to attack Iran in order for them to stop nuclear proliferation, and is the current administration willing to do so, if we were? Okay, next question. Uh, <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can clearly see it says for Joel Rosenberg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Listen, I, I don't know what the current administration is willing to do. Here's the problem with the Iranian nuclear program. The, they have been, uh, they've, they've done a very good job of spreading it out uh, and putting it in uh, pretty deep underground facilities. So it's a difficult target. It's a difficult target for any military, including the United States. Uh, unlike the Osiric reactor that the Israelis hit in 1981 in Iraq, which destroyed one facility and knocked out their entire program, you can't do that with the Iranian program. Now, I would hope that there is a, I would hope there's a military, a non-military solution. I would hope that we were able to uh, convince the Russians and the French and the other European nations uh, to do something economically and politically that would, uh, would be an incentive for the uh, Iranians to stop. Having said that, I think we talked about it enough today, both Joel and I, that uh, Ahmadinejad is not going to stop. He believes he's been called to uh, usher in the Mahdi. Therefore, somebody has to stop him. And uh, if the Israelis choose to do that, I think it's going to be a very difficult target for the Israelis. But we also know that Netanyahu has said this is the number one threat to Israel, to their survival, and he's he's going to have to take action if no one else will. So uh, I think it's a hard target, but uh, I uh, frankly don't think that uh, this administration or even the previous administration was willing to make the tough decision to uh, run a military strike against them. And uh, therefore, I think in the end, it, uh, if anybody does it, it will be Israel. I'm going to throw you a curveball. Is it okay? Make yes, one note go ahead. on that. Uh, and that is Netanyahu coming into the uh, prime minister role again this week is significant in, in how he built the unity government, the coalition that he formed uh, to be the next prime minister. Uh, he is clearly building a war cabinet. I think that's important to note. 
I know you don't all know the, all the intricacies of the Israeli political system, but uh, his defense minister is a gentleman named Ehud Barak. Now, Ehud Barak is the man who defeated him to be the prime minister in 1999. So Netanyahu has reached not just across the aisle, but to his political rival, one could argue a political enemy, to say, look, Barak, we agree on almost nothing. However, for the sake of this country, you are the, one of the most decorated generals in the history of Israel. And I need you on this team because whatever political differences we have on the economy, on social issues, our number one issue is Iran. And I think the fact that he brought Barack in and that Barack said yes, and it seems to be dividing the, uh, Barack's Labor Party quite badly, is significant. I think it's also significant that uh, the National Security Council uh, uh, advisor or, or, or chairman is a gentleman named Moshe Ya'alon. Uh, Moshe Ya'alon was, is, was interviewed for the Epicenter uh, film that we released uh, last year, or two years ago now, and he is now a, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister. So Netanyahu is building a team around him to go to war. I, don't, I can't say that he will. Uh, but he is clearly preparing for that eventuality. And I think this is one of the reasons we as evangelical Christians actually should go to Israel. And I would uh, encourage, there are let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, there's plenty of space in Israel. And uh, we need Mike McIntosh to bring a tour to Israel. And we need Roger Hedgecock to bring a tour to Israel. General, I hope you'll bring a tour to Israel, or we'll just consolidate and bring a whole group over. But Six now is the time to stand with Israel and to bless yes. her. Um, in light of this scenario that one of you asked, somebody else has a question that would follow it, General. According to end time prophecy, so they're probably talking Ezekiel, the countries, what would immediately follow, number four there, an attack on Iran? If that were to happen with Israel being the, initi the initiator, what do you think militarily? I think that uh, if Israel were to strike Iran, I think what you would see, and I believe this is part of the eschatology, the end time prophecy, I think you would see it accelerate the relationship between Russia and Iran. I think Russia would then uh, come to the aid of their little friends uh, in Persia or the Iranians. And I think you would see that relationship solidify with uh, increased military cooperation and military support, the sale of additional military uh, equipment and, uh, and even military advice. And that sets the stage for ultimately what is described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where Russia and Iran, supported by some other Middle East countries, uh, will ultimately wind up going to war against Israel so that the events of Ezekiel 38 and 39 will be fulfilled. I think there's a number of scenarios, and I think the answer is we just have to be careful to say we don't know exactly how it would play out. Uh, but. You could see an Israeli first strike, a preemptive strike, similar to 1967, where it was at that time not the Iranians under Ahmadinejad saying we're going to wipe Israel off the map. It was uh, President Gamal Abdel Nasser, an Arab socialist, who was saying we're going to throw the Jews into the sea. But in 1967, Israel was completely surrounded. Uh, the forces backed by Russia were uh, closing in, and Israel hit first. What Israel, ex Israel understood at that moment that it was an, a threat to their existence. And so they thought, look, we, this war will probably be horrifying, but if we don't do it, we may not be here tomorrow. And so they struck. Now, they planned in 1967 for the worst case scenarios. But those worst case scenarios didn't actually come to pass. As you recall, in six days, Israel more than tripled their land, reunified Jerusalem prophetically, brought back Judea and Samaria back into Israel prophetically, and on the seventh day, they rested. Now, amen. So it's possible that this war with Iran, if Israel felt it needed to do it, could be done in a way uh, that was, because of the grace of an almighty God, could move faster and be more decisive than we would imagine. But humanly speaking, you have to plan for a worst case scenario of thousands of missiles. I think we're talking about, at this point, 50,000 missiles from Lebanon, uh, Hamas, Syria, 
and Iran, not only heading towards Israel, but heading towards U.S. bases in, uh, in Iraq, towards the Gulf uh, uh, oil fields, towards the Straits of Hormuz. Oil could shoot three, four, five hundred dollars a barrel. I mean, this is why the world's telling Israel, don't do it. But Israel has to make a decision. It, it is constitutionally, and I would say biblically required, to protect the Jewish people no matter what. And if no one will come help them, except followers of Jesus Christ, standing with them, loving them, praying for them, stockpiling food and clothing and medical supplies, etc., they may have to do this on their own. Hmm. Well, okay. <laughs> but don't forget that... The, but, well, all right. I appreciate you giving that pause because back to the book of Esther. Well, not just so I can go on and on, but... Uh, yeah. I am Jewish and I, you know, but... It, I'm the one Jew that did, in America that didn't get the financial gene. I, you know, I just, I just do all the talking. But the book of Esther tells us that God can supernaturally intervene. So remember, the supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei is very ill. And he could pass away in the next few days, next few weeks, next few months. Ahmadinejad, there's an election in Iran in June. One doesn't suspect, it's, you know, it's not really a free country, but maybe Ahmadinejad gets washed down the river politically. Someone else emerges, not somebody that we'd feel real happy, cozy with, but not someone who is an apocalyptic messianic cult leader trying to bring about the end of the world. The world could change, and that could buy time. Slow things down, calm things down, and set the precursor for Ezekiel 38. I think the answer is we don't know how it's going to play out. That's why we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Okay, one, one comment on that, though. One of the, one of the worst-case scenarios is that they threaten the Persian Gulf oil. And the fact is, because we have yet to find alternatives to Persian Gulf oil, particularly domestically, if that is threatened, and the Iranians have already said if they are struck, they will uh, shut down the Persian Gulf. It then puts us in a situation where we don't even have the energy... We don't even have the energy sources. We can use up our petroleum reserves fairly quickly if we had to go in and try and reopen the Persian Gulf and take back the, uh, the oil fields there. So that could be a worst case scenario as well. Before I ask you this question, you can get prepared for Isaiah 17. Okay. Uh, can I ask you something personal that's in your book? Do you mind? It depends. My wife's here, so I've got to be careful. <laughs> Well, it was about that night in Waikiki. I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Not every day do we, the people, get to see people that are on television all the time and, you know, bestsellers and three stars on a shoulder. Uh, so, yeah. So I, I was blessed uh, not long ago before Christmas to speak at the Pentagon at a morning breakfast and pre they presented me with an appreciation letter which I wasn't expecting and a flag that flew over the Pentagon which is in my office that's a great honor and uh, the Colonel Little who happened to be the general's friend that we bumped into each other at breakfast uh, told me about his book and he went to his car and gave me his book and I read that book most of it on the way home from Washington DC and then that night and uh, we mentioned Iran. I just want to, this is just for you more than anything, to make what's gone on all day real to you, not just some people up here talking. These are real people that have real hearts like you. There was a front page uh, cover, full graphic, ugly. I wrote the editor of Time Magazine when it came out. I said, that was gross, that was bad, that was non-American. And it was our people who had crashed in Iran going for the hostages, right? They're going for the hostages. Uh, and there were Americans that died in that ugly, ugly scene. Not only is it mentioned in his book, Never Surrender, he was the commanding officer, and those were his friends. And I would, uh, some of you are too young to realize what happened there, but this man right here was there watching it unfold, and was willing to lay his life down to get those Americans out of that Iranian embassy. Would you mind, in just a few moments of telling us that picture, uh, I saw it as a real hurt in your heart. Uh, those were your friends, but we were going, and the government sort of slacked off on you, and you could have done more, but would you bring that alive to us? Well, 
for those of you who need a little refresher, when the Ayatollah came back and uh, the uh, Iranian or the uh, Islamic Revolution began 30 years ago, the Americans were taken in our embassy there in Tehran. We were directed on the night of the 24th of April, 1980, to go in and rescue those Americans. We were about 100 miles from Tehran. Um, and, and you need to understand that before we launched that operation, we stood in an old Russian air base in a place called Wadi Kenya, Egypt. And we lifted up our voices to God and we said, God, go with us. And we prayed and then we sang, God bless America. And we launched our mission knowing that we were going into a city of 5 million people with only 100 men, those of us in the Delta Force. We knew the odds were against us, but we prayed that God would go with us. That night as we were refueling our helicopters about 100 miles from Tehran, we were on the desert floor, and as we refueled our helicopters from C-130s, fixed-wing aircraft sitting on the desert floor, one of the helicopters tried to lift off and reposition, and the uh, dust in the dark, he, uh, he went vertigo and he lost it, and he crashed into the C-130. And uh, I was standing only a few feet from it. It engulfed in flame. It erupted into a huge ball of fire. And as I turned to run, I felt the Holy Spirit saying to me, stop. I turned and looked back and I realized that 45 of those men that had prayed in Wadi Kenya, Egypt, for God to go with us were hopelessly trapped inside that burning wreckage and they were all going to die. Ladies and gentlemen, there was only one thing that I could do. I couldn't go in the fire and get them. There was only one thing that I could do, and I began to pray, and I began to call on the name of the Almighty Jesus Christ. And I said, God, I know that you're the only one that can spare these men. I knew they were dead men. I knew that in a natural sense they couldn't survive. But as I stood and prayed, I said, God, go with us. God, bring these men out of this fire. And all of a sudden, the right troop door on the C-130 opened and 45 men hit the desert floor at a dead run. Now we, uh, we that were there that night still carry a great burden for having failed to not only rescue 53 Americans, but we failed our nation. We carried that burden. We still carry it today. But out of that, like the Phoenix, grew the greatest special operations capabilities that this nation or the world has ever known. And that's why we have uh, such a great capability today that's doing good things. And God spared those men because he's a God of miracles. Joel, I gave you some hints here. So Isaiah chapter 17, it says in the King James Version that Damascus would be a ruinous heap. And I recently was with some people having dinner that were born and raised in Damascus that told me, um, while in the Middle East, they, they told me there's a revival sort of going on among people in Damascus. Could you, you explain that? I think the question that the person is asking is, what does that mean about the destruction uh, at what point in history do you think that this destruction might occur? Well, you've got Isaiah 17, verse 1, if you've got your scriptures there. Uh, the oracle concerning Damascus, behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become a f fallen ruin. Talks about the sovereignty being removed from Damascus. Then in Jeremiah 49, there's a parallel prophecy uh, concerning Damascus. It uh, begins in verse uh, uh, Jeremiah 49, verse 23, uh, it says concerning Damascus, and it talks about how, her being disheartened and all kinds of anxieties. And then in verse 24, it says, Damascus has become helpless. She has turned away to flee, and panic has gripped her. Distress and pangs have taken hold of her like a woman in childbirth. It goes on to say that the young, her young men in Damascus will fall in the streets. All the men of war will be silenced in that day, declares the Lord of hosts. I will set fire to the wall of Damascus. Now, neither of those two prophecies have ever been fulfilled quite like that. And so, while it, neither of those verses say it's going to happen in the last days, here we are. 
in the last days. So it's going to happen at some point. Could happen during the tribulation. Could happen uh, amidst the battle of Armageddon. Could happen actually in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But some have speculated that it could happen even before the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39 when the Bible talks about Israel's enemies being subjected to fire falling from heaven and a massive earthquake and all kinds of other judgments. What's interesting, you're right, is not only is there the spread of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit moving so powerfully in the Muslim world, in Iran, in Sudan, in Pakistan, Afghanistan. What's happening in Damascus, in, in Syria, is amazing. So yes, we were just with uh, some Christian leaders uh, in the last few weeks because in early March, something extraordinary happened. A group of Syrian Arab Christian leaders, fi uh, filmmakers, made a movie and they decided to call it Damascus. And it's a docudrama. They hired the top uh, Syrian woman newscaster to host a, a film about, uh, a documentary about the life of Saul of Tarsus becoming Paul. The dramatic vision that he had on the road to Damascus, where he came face to face with Jesus Christ, where he turned from being a persecutor to an apostle. And so they decided to make this film. And so they made the film, but they also added, you know, so, so for example, this woman newscaster is walking down Straight Street, which is still there, uh, which is mentioned in uh, the book of Acts, and, and she's saying this is where it happened. And she's describing it all these different places that are significant in the life of Saul becoming Paul. Then it cuts to dramatized, uh, you know, uh, uh, feature film uh, moments where you kind of see how it all came to pass. Now, they had made the film last year, and they wanted to launch it because they're concerned. They love their country, they love their city of Damascus, and they're concerned by prophecies like these that what if it's not there soon? So they have a great passion. These are revivalists. They want to revive the church in Damascus, in Syria. So all that to say, they thought, well, you can't really show a film like that, an evangelistic film about the life of a Jew becoming a follower of Jesus unless you get the permission of the president of the country, who happens to be Bashar al-Assad, uh, who uh, he comes from a family that are, you know, these are just tyrannical dictators, God bless them. <laughs> bless them meaning draw them to the Lord, but I mean, you know, that's who they are. And so they sent a copy of the film to the president, and they said, could we get permission to see this? A few weeks later, they get a phone call from an aide in the palace, an aide to the president. They get, this guy gets called, the producer, and he says, uh, the president saw the film, was very moved, thinks this is, speaks very highly of the historic nature of Damascus as a city, Syria as a country. We would like to, he, the president would like to um, have a premiere of the film for all the top political leaders in the country, all the top business leaders and all the top religious leaders. And the man's like, who is this really? <laughs> right? I mean, what, what are we talking about here? So what happens is, they say, uh, the, the, the aide says, and the president would like this film to be shown in the opera. The opera is a beautiful facility th that's the president's personal theater. There's only been five events there in the entire Assad reign, and this was the sixth. So a few weeks ago, 1,100 top Syrian officials, including, including top cabinet ministers, watched the film, and the mufti the top Muslim leader of the entire country of Syria got up and didn't quote from the Quran. He kept quoting from the life of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And the room was filled with Muslims and a few Christians who'd made the film. Now, there's two things I want you to know. First, you're about to watch a clip. You'll be the first people outside of Syria to have seen this film. Now, we actually have the whole film, but we're not allowed to release the whole film yet. But you're going to see a few minutes of it, just to get a whiff of it. The second thing I want you to, as you're watching this, and you think every actor, when you see these actors, they're all Muslims. Playing Jews. Coming to Jesus. <laughs> Let's roll the videotape. سمي كوكب نسبة إلى كوكب الصبح المنير نور يسوع المسيح الذي كان أقوى من لمعان الشمس والذي أضاء في قلب الشاول وأنار ظلمته ليحوله من العبودية إلى الحرية 
في هذا المكان بنية دير يعرف اليوم بدير الرؤية ها أنا ما أرى قم واذهب إلى الزقاء الذي يقال له المستقيم واطلب في بيت يهودا رجلا رسوسيا اسمه شاو لأنه هو لا يصلي وقد رأى في رؤيا رجلا اسمه حنان داخلا وواضعا يده عليه لكي يمسك آمنت بك أيها الإله الحي ربي وسيدي ومخلصي شاول إني أعبدك باسم الآب والابن والروح القدس الإله الواحد آمين أعظمك أيها الإله الحي ما أعظمك يا رب أشكرك على محبتك العظيمة وحنانك وغفرانك ما أعظمك يا رب ما أعظمك يا رب هذا ما حصل معي لقد عرفت الطريق كان لي عيون لم أبصر بها وأذنان لم أسمع بهما وقلب من دون بصيرة أما الآن فإني أبصر وأسمع وقلبي أناره يسوع بمحبته ورحمته العظيمة إنكم تنتظرون مجيء المسيح ملك اليهود المسيح الذي تنتظرونه قد أتى هو الذي رفضتموه وأنكرتموه وصلبتموه ماذا حل بشاول؟ أليس هو نفسه الذي أنكره واضطهد أتباعه؟ إنه بهذا الكلام ينقض شريعتنا إلى متى ستنتظرون المسيح المخلص هذا هو الذي تحدث عنه موسى والأنبياء فتشوا الكتب والنبوءات You know I can't make this up I know I'm a fiction writer too but you can't make this stuff up the president of Syria has seen this please pray for him Please pray for all these government leaders. The Minister of Transportation and Culture, or Minister of Transportation, uh, apparently got his invitation late, or he was out of the country or something, and he called the morning of the showing, the premiere, and they, he said, I want to come. And they said, I'm so sorry, but uh, the room is filled, and we don't have any more space for a cabinet minister in the Assad government. Uh, all the other ministers were there. God is clearly showing his love for the people of Damascus. And I personally don't know when these prophecies will come to pass, but I don't want to stand before Jesus and have him say, why exactly didn't you get involved in this thing that I was doing? So please pray about it if you'd like to join part of it. It's been an honor to have this take place here today. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.